<laughs> meeting to order of the Board of County Commissioners uh, this day of February 26, 2019, uh, for the workshop. Would everybody at this time please silence their electronic devices and please stand for the uh, blessing and the pledge. Invocation. O merciful Creator, your hand is open wide to satisfy the needs of every living creature. Make us thankful for your loving providence and grant that, remembering the count that we must one day be faithful stewards of your good gifts. Amen. Amen. I pledge and to the for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible. Uh, Madam Clerk, roll call. District 2, Commissioner Michael Moore. Here. District 3, Commissioner Catherine Sharkey. Here. District 5, Commissioner Jack Mariano. Here. District 6, Ron Oakley. Here. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, today we have the workshop and the agenda. Uh, we start off with general obligation bonds. So Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, just we want to hit uh, three topics today. Um, one with the general obligation bonds, kind of just give you a high level overview of where we are, what the schedule looks like, so that you have an idea of when things are going to happen as part of the different bonds, whether it's libraries or parks or the fire stations or the jail. Then we're going to kind of go through our revenue outlook. We're right in the middle. We're starting, but we're I guess heavy into budget at this point. But we want to give you an idea from a high-level perspective what the revenue outlook looks like for 2020. And then we'll end that with a discussion about the stormwater assessment, kind of a continuation of a discussion that happened two years ago on stormwater and the stormwater utility. So that's kind of the – we'll go through that today. And uh, so we'll lead it off with Andrew Baxter with facilities, kind of walking us through the bond stuff. All right. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, a few years back, I took a trip to Disney with, uh, with my kids and my family. As we were walking around in the middle of uh, the park, they were doing construction in the park. And around the construction, they built a construction barrier, but it, on the construction barrier, there were all these wonderful quotes from, uh, from Disney. And uh, I took a picture of one of those, and it reminded me today as I was talking about this, these projects. It says, when we go into a new project, we believe in it all the way. We have confidence in our ability to do it right, Walt Disney. The facilities team uh, believes in these GoBond projects. And we have confidence that we are ready and prepared to do it right. Can so, can I just stop you a second? Sure. I'm glad to see you. Take those pictures of those quotes. <laughs> <laughs> I love them. <laughs> They're great. Um, today, I'd like to kind of sh Whoa. share three things with you. Um, first, what the status of the Go Bond funding is, um, what our biggest challenge is related to the project that we foresee, and our overall timeline for all the Go Bond projects. So bond timeline in November, the bonds were approved by the voters. In early December, the BCC approved the bond resolutions. In late December, the bond validation cases were filed with the courts. In January, judges were assigned those validation cases. We have gotten word that uh, on 325 of March, uh, the hearing dates will begin for the bonds, and we anticipate bond issuance. Are there any questions that you have related to the bonds themselves? We have uh, Bob Gehring from OMB, and we also have bond counsel here with us today. Are we putting a plan together what we're going to do, or are we just going to look to line the money up first? Oh, no. We, we, we'll get into that. Okay. We're about to walk you through our plan. I'm okay. going to walk you through how we okay. tend to spend that right now. I think in – you can only spend, or you can only assess 85 percent of what you'll spend that year. Is that correct? Or I think we we assess whatever we believe we're going to borrow for that, for that particular year. Yeah. And so then we budget 95 percent of that. Oh, okay. All right. Good. That's that's what we where we are with the bonds. Next is our biggest. Uh, there's a lot going on in the chart, and I'll um, step by step. If you'll indulge. the blue area that shaped um, is our typical, um, and so you'll see that 
Um, okay. Down at the bottom of the chart, oops, there we go. Down at the bottom of the chart is, is the years, all the way out to FY25. The vertical axis on the chart is in millions of dollars. And so the blue area of the chart is our typical capital and non-capital work that we produce every year within facilities management. On average, that's represented by this gray dashed line, which is about $21 million a year on average. The bond projects are indicated by this red shaded area. And then when you add the blue and the red together, that's this green mountain that we're going to be climbing. So that's all the bond projects and how they're staggered out over time. On average, what that means is this orange line is our new normal, is what we call our surge. And so that's going to be our total workload over the next several years. We're going to be coming back uh, through the budgeting process. In order to accomplish these projects, we're probably going to need some surge staffing um, just to manage these projects and ensure the quality that we expect uh, is achieved. Because um, we're, we're basically doubling our workload for the next few years. Yes, please. Those, those FTEs or that, if they are FTEs, um, they can be included in the, the funding for the bonds. It's not additional. We're not going to be obligated to take out additional funds to pay for those. As we understand from Bond Council right now, those FTEs are not entirely. Still, there's still some debate on that. Yeah. How many are there? We're, we're not ready to have the no, final discussion say, with you today. We had when we yeah. talked about the bonds that we're going to hire extra staff. Well, to oversee those projects. any 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 staff we hire obviously would be temporary staff anyway. Yeah. They're not going to be exactly. they're not going to be full time for the next twenty years. Oh, how many? How but, many can I finish real quick? Sorry, let me just continue. Ahead. Thanks. So, you, why can't you then? You, why can't you just subcontract for those staff members? Well, they would be con they, they, they would be contract staff. Yeah, but once you go through, why can't you just go through a, a, one of the vendors that are part of a project to bring this to over, help oversee those? It's one possible way. Yeah. We've talked about a couple different areas. Um, the other focused area is in QC. And so QC, you want that third party perspective mm -hmm. um, to ensure that you're getting what you're paying for. It doesn't make sense to pay the QC something that you're already Well, paying. I understand that. I understand how that works, but it would just, it would just be we're, a different we're still working. Vendor. We're still working the answers to the budget process. So, I mean, I, I think today you've seen that there are some. It's a challenge. We'll, we'll, we'll be working through administration to, to bring the right solution back to the board um, at the appropriate time during the budget season. Um, but I wanted to make you aware of, of the overall schedule and the challenge that, that we're, that's the most significant challenge. As we then move into the actual projects themselves. An additional question, sir? No? Okay. Um, I'm going to have a few charts that look very similar to this as we go through the four main bonds. Um, the first bond that we're going to talk about is related to the detention center. But each chart will be laid out like this. Um, there'll be a project name, the amount. If there's any additional notes related to that project, I'll, I'll be putting them up there. And I'll talk through that. And then there'll be an overall timeline. The green D represents the design phase of the project carried out over time. The orange C represents the construction phase of the project. In the design phase, it, it includes things, so you may see design phase that is pretty extensive, but it includes things like land if needed. It includes design procurement. It includes design permitting procurement if needed, and pre-construction of that project. There's a lot that goes into the design side uh, on the upfront before you actually start moving dirt. So for the jail project, it's a $128 million project. 
We're going to be planning to add 1,000 beds to the jail and also update and upgrade all of central service includes medical <coughs> intake, all of those other things, the kitchen, all of those support services that are needed for the jail to support that additional surge um, in inmate population. Well, also, back, we built a 750-bed addition to the jail. No, uh, no expansion to central done at that time. So accommodate not only what was done then, but now also what this additional surge is going to be. Mr. Chairman? If I could, and I, I know I talked to uh, Dan, uh, Administrator Biles, about this, but uh, I wanted to get down uh, to look at Charlotte County, what they did with their facility. Uh, they built like a hospital to go along with it. So kind of like we were actually a hospital at the jail now, we're going to need more room, as Andrew just talked about now. But that may be something to us to go look at, incorporate. I was going to have, take the trip with you and, and Eric as well and Andrew. Um, but I think every commission maybe should go take a look at that. And if there's other models that are out there where people have done this medical treatment, because let's face it, if they're in there, it's very expensive the way they're doing it now. They may have a better way and a better uh, result at the end. And the success that they say they're having, I think, is something that is probably worthy of us taking a look at. Okay. We can absolutely take a look at that. Sure. Thank Chairman. you. Chairman. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. And on that, and I know I've spoken to the sheriff, obviously needs to be involved in this process, but, you know, mental illness, addiction, um, all that needs to be included, and, and I like what Commissioner maybe it's a provider comes in, maybe it's big, whoever that provider is, because the idea, in my opinion, if we can help these folks, so it's not a revolving door, the numbers should go down. Um, and I know that, I believe we all agree with that. I just want to make sure, I didn't hear you bring it up, and that, that needs to be a part of it, and I believe it is in Charlotte County. Okay. Yeah. So well, central yeah. services includes medical. Uh, but working through a partner and provider, it's something we can absolutely work with the stakeholder and the sheriff um, to ensure that they partner in that. And they have, I know they have some there already, but we just, we, there's no doubt we need more. So, okay. okay. Yep. All okay. right. Any further questions about the jail? Right. Moving on. So fire rescue is next. We're going to do work on uh, station 42. That's going to be uh, located at Suncoast Parkway and SR 50. Um, that's going to be a four base new location, a brand new station, and it's going to be one story. The next station is going to be station 17 in Seven Springs. Um, that's going to be a four bay replacement station, currently a two bay station. And that one is because of the, the, the site limitations, on, that one's going to be our first two story station. Site 19 is Cross Bayou in US 19. It's going to be a five bay replacement. This is one of our busiest stations in the county. This is going to be a two story location. Station 40 is also going to be a five bay new station at SR 52 and US 19. And because of the, the lots that we're looking at there, uh, this will likely be a two story, but it could possibly be a one story. Again, we're going to have to acquire land here. Station 20 is in Shady Hill. This is a replacement. It's going to be a three bay, one story. Station 22 in Lando Lakes. Uh, this is the station uh, just at the end of the jail the, uh, on Central Boulevard. This is going to be a four bay replacement, one story. Click. Oh, there we go. Station 44 is going to be a four bay new location. It's located at SR 54 in Meadow Point. Station 18 is in Crystal Springs. That'll be a four bay replacement. Station 45 will be a new location in Bexley, and that'll be a one story. And then last is the training center in Landa Location for the training center. Here's what the overall schedule looks like in relation to those projects. Station 44, you can see design is going to kick off um, very shortly after 42, excuse me, 42. Uh, 42, 17, 19, design is going to kick off immediately after we procured um, the bond funding. Um, and so we are preparing the solicitations right now for all of those projects. Uh, station 40 is going to kick off later in, in FY19 for design. 20 and 22 uh, will begin right around uh, second quarter of FY20. And then 44 and 18 and 45 will begin design 
uh, middle of uh, FY21. And training center is also right aligned with uh, FY21. Questions related to our fire rescue projects. Jim, yes. could you go back um, two slides, Zach? Sure, sir. On the uh, station 42 at Suncoast and Parkway, uh, whereabouts is that located? We're still determining that exact location, um, but it, it'll be that's generally the area. Okay. I mean, I know we got a lot of construction going on there with King Arthur, et cetera. Maybe there's a spot there, but also there's an old uh, state police barracks that's there. Maybe you could actually incorporate some of our design into that building or that lot of work with the state, being that they have it, they're not using it. It may save us some money to, to kind of bring the number down. The state owns it. I don't yeah, know. I don't believe that's owned by the state. I yeah, think they lease that. They lease it? That's, yeah. yeah okay. I think that's owned by the veteran family. Okay, all right, so anyway, so it could be an opportunity there. And right. the other the other property that's in Bexley as well, I, I noticed that number was up higher. Is that just because it's a little bit later in your so adjusting all, for all of these funding amounts are what were in the, the published budget mm -hmm. um, this year. As we go through the design and procurement phases, mm -hmm. these will all get fine-tuned to be what, what the market rate okay. truly is for that. These are just estimates at okay. this point. But, but there, to answer your point, there is cost growth built through the program. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Thank you. Any other questions related to fire projects? Parks and Rec received um, $20.2 million in GO Bond uh, funding. Uh, facilities is taking on the project management responsibilities for the larger or more specialized uh, Parks and Rec projects. These will total a little over Seven million, and you can see those ones that are listed there. Uh, Parks is taking on the remainder of those um, smaller, more specialized uh, amenity projects that are related to actual parks equipment, um, and and also deferred maintenance. And so the parks projects that facilities is taking on is to replace the uh, the building at the West Pasco office. This is also known as their Congress Street maintenance office. Um, also looking at the San Pasco maintenance building roof, the San Antonio maintenance building roof, Stanley Park restrooms, the concession at Ingle Park, the Land Lakes Recreation Center pool pump room, the fire alarm at the J. Ben Harrell, or also known as the Holiday Recreation Complex, the concession building at Mitchell Park, uh, and the concession building at Berks Park. There's actually two concession buildings at Berks Park. You'll see another one down a little later on the list. The concession at Shady Hills, the Wesley Chapel District Park AC replacements, the maintenance building at Stanley Park, renovations at Anklet River Park, um, the second Berks Park concession that I mentioned, the maintenance building at uh, Engel, the roof there, um, the concession building at Pine Hill, and the Heritage Community Center roof. All of those projects will be done uh, with project management oversight by the facility. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Moore. And I've mentioned this before. Keith's going to laugh at me. I see him in the audience. The, the concession buildings and the costs in these, I mean, you guys put in a, a bar and, like, indoor seating. And, <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I mean, that's just the cost in those. It's, it's just craziness. I mean, Lily can build build a 5,000-square-foot a 5, house. Build. Understood. So <laughs> all of these will be, will be designed at the market rate. This is what was in the was in the financial plan that was published by the in the budget. We will, as we go out for design and procurement, we will fine tune these numbers. And as I come back to you, you'll see these numbers over time. As but right now, this is what I was able to pull from the budget. And, and, and again, you're dealing with two different building codes, commercial versus residential, which does does impact the cost. <coughs> so, so there is a cost right, so impact. I'm spending a lot of time in concession stands. Yeah. And, Volunteering at concession right. stands. Um, I, I'm just trying to figure out what we're what we're getting for that because I understand the commercial building codes, but again, I don't care if you're laying brick all the way from bottom to top, which I assume you would, because these are one-story buildings, um, which would be obviously very safe and meet and meet the fire codes right. and, meet, and meet the hurricane standards. I, I just I, anything over like literally like over 150 is almost alarming to me for Design. what we're getting. You know, you have obviously you have if you want to put the hood and the Inside, that's more expensive. Specialized you know, equipment. That's, it costs a little bit, but as somebody that I get done a lot of evaluations, we can 
can walk into businesses in the past yeah. and what they're worth, that seems very... I think we got a design pretty close on the Berks Park one that we could probably walk you through and show you some things that are in there. We do what? The Berks Park one, I think. I think that one's fine in progress. I think it was one we we got started yeah. early. Didn't they see? Yeah. yeah. That we, so we can walk you through what, what's involved in those things. So. I think the idea um, was to use the most We all think that number is um, is a little higher than we would want to see. Um, but to answer, write the specs and then we go out to, to bid. Hopefully that number can come down. But that's what we've seen. Mr. Chairman, and if, if there are cost savings where, let's say, you're going to take one design, and I know tweaking is good for certain things, but if you're going to be able to stick with the same architectural plans and just worry about the civil down below, yeah, yeah. you got to be able to save a whole bunch of money. And, and, I, and I think if you do a contract where, okay, you're going to get four different contracts, those bid numbers should be able to get dropped down quite a bit. When your water, sewer, all that stuff's already... Mm -hmm. So that, that's taken care of. Perfect. You're not, you're not running lines. You're not running gas lines. And we're working through some different contracting mechanisms that will enable us to, in these smaller, relatively, um, projects um, to enable it to expedite those and stick with one design firm and, and we're going out for a new design master design firm um, and also going for um, some smaller GC where we can do uh, <coughs> expedited awards to those smaller GCs to move these projects forward and, and have a good relationship with those folks and because the, the square footage on the no more than four or five hundred square foot. Yeah, they're they're pretty small. Now right. some of them have two stories because there are there's an observation. More than that, and in some in some cases, remember it's the restroom. Well, if you add the restrooms in, it, I, I can see that. Oh, yeah, right. That's, restrooms. That's, and, that's, and, that's, and the, the specs and design that the actual concession rather than eight hundred percent square foot. Chairman, look at this. some local GC bid on these projects. I think that number would come way, way down, way down. Hope so. Yes. Yeah. Just so I'm clear, and I just I see design F Y nineteen, design twenty, design twenty one, design twenty two. You're telling me that we're going to have one company come in. I would think we could just say, okay, here's three designs we need. Here's one concession. Here's another pay somebody up front and be done with the design we're not having so you're saying we're going to use one contractor to do all these concessions no i didn't, I didn't say because it just seems to me like it would save us money if we say okay here's we already There's know kind lot. of what our design is going to be we already know we need to do five of them or yeah. whatever so here's here's the size difference i don't know how many are they all going to be different keith i don't think well, so are they? so you know commissioner i was going to say that that's I think correct. I think the goal would be great to have one spec that we can plop down into the facility. And we're probably going to be able to do that, but in some camp, it's just the way the fields are laid out, we might need to expand a footprint, do a little bit of tweaking. But probably, you know, working off of a similar we can replicate mm -hmm. is the goal, um, and we're just going to have to see if we can plug and play at every facility. Because well, we don't need again the RFQ process takes too long. As we go through that, then we got to go. Procurement, so we're looking at six months just to even get anywhere to where if we can do it at the beginning, these things all be above timeline, we can get them done. So that's, I'm just trying to save everybody time and money. Yep. It's all. So I, I absolutely hear you. Uh, and that's why we're doing two things right now um, with procurement. Um, we are looking, we have an RSQ that we're going to be publishing out um, very shortly to talk about a new um, design firm um, for projects of this size and scope. Okay. relatively small um, then we're also looking at um, what we call a MATOC it's full award task order contract it allows you to select pre-qualified um, vendors um, have them all on basic once you have a project identified you go to those pre-qualified vendors and you say here's the project scope they all give you the quote and you immediately go because they're already they're already right. basically through the purchasing process. You can immediately go to award. We're excited. Yeah. Right to that as well. I think 
job order contract is what I've called before, <laughs> and that's how we've done that other places. So Mr. Chairman, just yeah. to follow up. Yes. Yeah. And again, and I appreciate all the work you guys are doing on everything. And, and Keith, I think you know where I probably know where I was coming from too. Is like any savings allows you to do more, right? right. The bond's there, Correct. you know. So any savings allows you to do more at your at your parks. So if you can save a few hundred grain on these, yeah. you, you can put up a, you can <laughs> put up no a, problem. That's our goal. But yeah, but you know, it allows you to maybe you need another concession in a different park, or maybe you know if you can. I mean, cut your costs. The and, goal on every one of these projects is to you know, is to build what we need for the lowest lowest cost, right? Yeah. You know, but to build high quality too, because we want it to last. It'll last, sure. Okay. And so, as you look at these park projects, if I, if I could. Sure, sir. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, I don't see anything up there for SunWest. I know, Keith, we've talked about different things at SunWest to go up there. And currently, we've got the new sidewalks going along the channel, which I think are going to be great. Block the wind from blowing <laughs> the wall on the other side. Looks like they've got a good foundation set up with that. But we've talked about putting a floating dock around the whole back, kind of like partially floating where you can kind of connect the one peninsula and then putting something along there. Um, and then the second lake that's in the back, uh, we'll look at doing something there and then maybe some shade structures. Is that anywhere in the regular part of the plan? If it's so, not with this, that's going to be coming up? Yeah, so this, this list is all the Just the bonds up. Yeah, yeah. The this is all the bonds. Okay. So that would be new capacity projects that okay. we would look at through the impact fees and the, the standard budget process. Okay. That would, yeah, that's Thank you. Related. But you'll have more of them when they start building some of those projects out there. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. So one of the things you'll notice about parks projects here, there's there's only one project that's um, aligned for FY21, but as you go back and look at the master schedule, um, the, the jail, FY21, um, if you went to the fire rescue, there's six new projects in construction in FY21. So just look at resource needs. There, there's a little gap here in Parks and Rec in FY21, but um, it aligns and helps us balance that workload out across the board. Library projects are the last project group. New River Library is already in the design phase, and that's uh, moving forward along with uh, Centennial Park. However, we, uh, we need to work with uh, the SOE and libraries to deconflict um, a, a scheduling conflict for the presidential elections in FY20, or excuse me, 22. Um, 20. 20. 20. Yeah, 20. 20. 20. Right. You're right. You're right. You're right. And 22 that have to be deconflicted. Um, and so, yes, correct. That one's the 21. Um, Hudson and Land Lakes are the 22 ones. Um, South Holiday Library uh, is scheduled in U Embry Library. Hudson Library and Land Lakes again have the deconfliction that we have to go through with SOE and Regency Park Library. Here's how that uh, schedule looks uh, as we approach those projects. New River uh, and Centennial are, like I said, already under design, um, and we anticipate right around the beginning of FY20, so for November timeframe, to kick off those projects in the construction phase. Um, South Holiday Library, uh, Hugh Embry begin uh, as soon as we get the, the bond funding, uh, and Hudson Regional will begin later this year. Land of Lakes and Regency Park, again, uh, in FY20, we begin the design for those. So being very aggressive with the, li with the libraries to get them updated and, and re -add. Just Just so everybody is aware, the, the, the plan for these is close the library during construction and do the renovation and get it but move the operation to construction. So just so everybody is aware, it, it, if we close the libraries, we can give the contractor the, the entire footprint so we pass the construction done faster and less expensively than if we tried to phase it through those facilities. From a cost perspective and timing perspective, that's the better way to work. It gets us in, get the construction done, and then out of there as quickly as we can. Which is when, when the other issue that, with the SOE is we got to, yeah. those libraries have to be open for the SOE during the do that you're talking about taking books and everything inside out. Yeah, I, yes. I don't know if you, Kathy, or if you or Sean. What that would look like. I just want to make sure everybody's aware now before we close the first one that that's what the plan is. Yeah. That's what we're operating on and how we're designing these. Because that's these quite a plan, move. Save time say. and money. Yes, sir. I didn't hear your question, sir. Oh, 
But you're talking about you temporary. clean everything when the temporary, you're going to clean everything out of there so they can do the construction. So Absolutely. So we go yeah. through a process called weeding where we take books that have probably reached a certain expectancy. You know, I don't think you need a 2007 computer book. It's not quite as accurate anymore. Um, we remove all those things and we reduce spread it out to the other locations as well as the computers. Because obviously, if you shut down a branch in one location, yeah. those patrons go somewhere else. Oh, yeah. So we're also making sure that reach efforts to the local community during these times. And we're working with uh, parks and other organizations to have locations so they can uphold so they still have the programs that they come to enjoy. Uh, we don't want to lose patrons during this. We want to actually increase them by getting out and that we don't usually have a chance to yeah. make it into because we'll have extra staff available during the, the, the remodel. Right. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Brown. You know, when I, when I look in, I'm sure we'll look at the others as well, but just Hudson Library and Reesey Park Library. Those libraries are pretty close together. Right now, the way you get your construction set, Hudson is still going to be under construction while you're going to then start constructing Reesey Park Library. I would recommend that we kind of like focus, if we can, as we look at alternate locations, if you're going to have libraries that close together, that we kind of like finish one, and then get everyone to go for the next yeah, for that year or something to go over there, and the yeah. same thing goes for there. So yeah, you can kind of twig to where yeah, those I things are closer. You can at least give them an alternative way right. to go something that's closer. Yeah, yeah. And, we, and we can we can shift that a little bit. And again, there's yeah. three that we're still it's working. One one quarter shift. Yeah. yeah, we're still there's still three we're working with the SOE to make sure we impact his operation. The election in twenty. But I tell you, with the, with the SOE, as far as the libraries go, maybe we need to go look at I know there's like a couple of churches in those areas, too, that maybe we just need to go for the churches the next couple of years to say, here's where you're going to go, try to work that out, and just make it a, a thing for next two years are going to be, the next two elections are going to be at the churches instead of, like, worrying about how to fit, if we're going to be able to fit them in. Is early voting of those? So we are able to do early voting? I'm just saying. Yes. Yeah, so that's what those are. Yeah. Yeah. So again, I, I I think a couple of these are only start date from October till. Mm -hmm. So I don't think those are really that big of a challenge. I think there's one that it's a bigger challenge, but I think two of them are. It, it, we're talking thirty days. Construction start by thirty days. Yeah. So it's not a big thing. And, and maybe the Land Lakes Library, if, if we look at that, maybe it's use our utility building for the uh, ten days of early vote. Really kind of I know. I know. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. Mr. Chairman, yeah. Lease. only do early voting there, right? So the, the, they use the um, <coughs> help me out here rec center on an election day, right? Okay. So that's all you have to worry about there. Move early voting to the rec center. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll use again. We'll work I'm just saying. We'll work yeah. with right Brian. Next door. We'll work with Brian to make sure that we do conflict and that he can meet his mission. <laughs> Two. Like, yeah, that, that, is, that is a presidential <laughs> election, so that will be a big. So. Okay. Okay. Uh, Thank you. So that's the facilities uh, briefing. I look forward to coming back and as we progress through the through these bond projects, being able to come back and show you like real numbers and show you actually some progress pictures as we continue forward through these projects. So, if there's any additional questions, I'll be glad to answer them at this time. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Now we're going to the, the revenue outlook for the new fiscal year 2020. Okay. I'm All sure right. that's going to be a real pretty. I'll picture. let Bob kick that one off. <laughs> Not too bad. <laughs> Good morning. So as Dan mentioned, I'd like to take this opportunity just to go through our uh, preliminary estimates for the fiscal year 2020 budget revenues. And by revenue, by preliminary, I mean that this is the very first cut we've had at these revenues. As we go through the year and we, we get more information, of course, we will we'll update these uh, revenues as we go along. Before we jump into the revenues, though, I wanted to talk about our reserve and give you an update on our reserves. As you're aware, the Government Finance Officers Association has a best practice where they recommend to local governments that they set aside 16.7 percent of budgeted expenditures into an emergency reserve account. Uh, that's about two months worth of uh, operating uh, revenues or operating expenditures. In all of our major funds, we have 16.7%. Our general fund is at 9.6%, and that uh, policy was set a few years ago during the recession 
and by the, the board, we set that uh, policy at 9.6. As we look here, as we look, this chart, you see the bottom two rows or two lines of this are the assessed values for the general fund and the fire fund. As you can see, the taxable assessed values are increasing, which means that they're generating more uh, property tax revenue. The interesting thing about this chart, if we extended it back to 2008, which is not shown on here, we would see that the assessed values in 2008, we've just achieved those assessed values in uh, 2019. So it's taken us 11 years to recover that assessed value that declined during that recession. So what we're showing you here is the main point of this is that as our assessed values are increasing, that delivers more revenues for the county. But at the same time, that top line with the with the diamond shape, that is the population increase. And so as our revenues are increasing, the population is also increasing at the same time, meaning that their demand for services is increasing as well. So based on what we see in uh, activity in our building department, as well as walking around, looking at what's going on in the community, we believe that the assessed values for next year will be about where they were for 19, so 9.5% increase. So. We're projecting, and we've given our department's direction the no millage rate increase for 2020, and we'll come back to you for that. Uh, we wanted to caution our uh, homeowners that even though the property values could increase by 9.5%, the Save Our Home Protection for Homesteaded Properties limits the increase in, in the assessed values for homesteaded properties to 3% or the rate of inflation, whichever is less. In 2020, the rate of inflation was 2.1%, and so the, of course, the assessed values on a homesteaded property couldn't increase by more than 2.1%. The cap for non-homesteaded properties is 10%. The assessed values can't increase more than 10% on a uh, non-homesteaded property, so 9.5% gets us just about almost to that cap for non-homesteaded properties. So if we look at the 9.5%, increase and what does that generate in additional property tax revenues? It would generate an additional $18.5 million, and that's budgeted, of course, budgeted at the 95% level, which we're required to do. Traditionally, we have split that increase with the sheriff and the board side and other constitutionals. So if we split that, it's about 9.2, 9.3 to the sheriff, and the remainder would be to the county and other constitutionals. If we take that 9.3 million and then deduct from that the TIF and the CRAs, would make $3.6 million available to the board and to the other constitutionals for additional revenues for fiscal year 2020. Mr. Chairman? Go ahead. Before we get into the weeds of the war. So we're going to approximately 3.6. <clears throat> I know when Commissioner Wells and I first came to the board, um, and you, unfortunately you guys had to deal with this because Commissioner Mariana more than we did, but obviously during the recession, there's a lot of cuts that had to be that had to take place. Um, when we came in, now revenues increase, doing a lot of the deferred maintenance, doing a lot of catch up. Okay, we don't know how long the cycle is going to last. I mean, it's been good for a while. If we if we knew that, we'd all be you know Warren Buffett, right? Mm -hmm. um, so thinking about you know if it does change and market conditions do change to possibly two or three, four years from now. Um, do we think we're at the point now of, let's say the 3.6, where we don't need to use it all and we start socking a little away again? Because the last thing I'd hate to see was, would be in you know, two or three or four years down the road, of another crash. That's a great point. And then we have to. It's a bullet on a slide. Oh, it is. Oh yes, well, sir. I'm glad you guys thought of that. Because that's a good. That's a great idea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we, so yeah, you understand my concern. Yes, is that because the last thing yes, we want to do is come back three or four years from now and have to have a big millage increase to maintain services? Or right now. yeah, or cut or, or cut or cut staff or cut, so, staff, or cut yeah, services, so, right? So, so we are looking at that. Um, there'll be a bullet later that talk about drivers when we come to the budgeting mm -hmm. process and. We're looking at a glide slope to get back to. Yeah. So now that's not something you can do in one year. Well, of course but, not. But, you know, it, but you're right. It is effectively a rainy day fund. You know, the counties in the panhandle are using reserves. That's how you pay for those things is you pull out a reserve to cover the expenses. So that's what we need to do. Yes, there is. We are thinking about that. We're going to try to at least make some improvement this year. Now, how much kind of will depend, but 
you know, we are working on that. Yeah, and I and I can appreciate. And I, I know some, I mean, some team members um, maybe don't like to hear that, or, or or you know, the clerk's office or the property appraiser or the S, you know, supervisor of elections. But again, we have to prepare for that. Think about the future because yeah. I would love for this cycle to last for ten more years, but. I don't yeah, see we, have possible. A, we have a yeah. slide on that too. So. You know, right. okay. Yeah. But and we're building so. back our because every year, last few years we've gone into our reserves and brought some monies out. Is that bit, back up yeah. to where it's supposed to be? I mean, you, you, yes. you've used some one-time money to fund some continuing operation expenses, right. which I think we won't have to do this year. We needed to do. Mm -hmm. I think it, you know between. I think we'll be we'll be in good shape this year. We have some bullets on a, a slide and okay. right. a couple we can talk about some key drivers that we're looking at so okay mr chairman yes sir. And, and i think getting the res reserves up is a good idea i also think the way this board i think has made some really good moves and in, in the flexibility of those reserves such as united way to go give money for the uh, first response of the coast guard people and federal employees that may be right. having a shortfall to help them out uh, somehow we use the money to get to buy that land for uh, Habitat for Humanity for Leisure Lane. So having that flexibility gives me comfort to keep that growing. But I think everything should be, you know, not only with our budget, sheriff's budget, et cetera, we should make sure as we're spending money, just because it's there, we don't need to spend it. But just right. if it's justifiable every step of the way, then let's keep going it. And if we pull the reserves away, we'll have that flexibility. If something comes up, we can make a move. Yeah, and, and, you know, the, the general fund reserve is actually <laughs> – that they, we we put money aside in the fund reserve for the sheriff's budget. There's no fund reserve in his budget. It's in it's in the general fund reserves because it's yeah. general fund money. Right. It's all right. one spot. And so, you know, when he sent deputies up to the Panhandle to help run a couple of towns' police departments for mm -hmm. a, for a few weeks, they're submitting their paperwork to get reimbursed for that. You'll see before you mm -hmm. the board here in a few weeks on the 12th of the meet let next meeting. To, re to give them that money back out, general fund reserves, until we get reimbursed from FEMA. Mm -hmm. So, but that's that's the intent of that. The reserve there is to use it for those things. And I want to, and I want to compliment you the way you set it up for us because it didn't happen that way years ago. But the flexibility you give us and the, right. and the open transparency we have with it, I think gives everybody a lot of comfort that we're going to use the money when we need it, but for the right reasons too. And the, and the two things you didn't mention were loans; they weren't grants. That money will come back. Yeah. So just to be clear. <laughs> so. Oh, yeah. That's right. I'd just like to mention our business planning process, which is the beginning of the budget process, actually asks our departments to justify any new dollars. So you'll be able to see if they're requesting new dollars, what that justification is in terms of what the customer expects. And, and much like we did last year, where we budgeted and looked at tax in not only 19, but in 20, we're going to continue to do that. In, in fact, we're going to continue. We're actually we look in future years, but m make sure that if we add something, what does it look like over the next few years, and what would it look like through a, say, uh -huh. to make sure we can stress test the budget right. so we can do these things have a negative impact service-wise and people-wise, right? Because, I mean, we all have people either. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, we're doing that, and we're going to continue to build that and make that strong. When we come forward with a budget, certainty that they've looked at this they've stress tested they know that you know that this is a good solid budget and sorry. Yes, Mr. Quick, well, just a couple of questions and Commissioner Moore kind of brought it up and uh, you know when we first got elected we were seeing the pretty much recovering from the worst you know downturn we've ever seen um, I wasn't here then I know Commissioner Mariano was where they had to lay people off and I I, I don't want to ever be in that situation and I know that's why I'm so critical with saying you know technology to Hire so many employees. We've done a great job paying our employees what they should be getting paid. Um, I'd rather pay our employees more to have them do more. And I think we're there. I think we have ever right. seen engagement and morale as high as it's. But I guess my point is, I I'm just kind of curious that maybe employees we have now compared to 2008. Just just for my own knowledge, I just I we know that this isn't going to last. We know that you know we saw economists last that said if this lasts another, I think, five years, it will be the yeah. longest. And you guys obviously well, have well, we have a, we have a talk about I just, that, But yes, we have a great team. It's unbelievable. The energy we have, all 57 right. sides of our business, and I mean that. I'm proud of that. So I just want to make sure that we are still. We're, we track that, and you'll see that.
budget slides. We, we actually, that's a standard slide that we show, not now, but in the May okay. and the June discussion. No, the business plans have been great. I mean, they've done a great job with it. You run it just like a business. Show me what you need and why and what's your return on investment. I think it's awesome. So, right. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. Okay, so if we translate that 9.5% increase in assessed value to the fire fund, that is about $4.3 million in additional revenue for the fire department for the new stations and other types of uh, initiatives that they're interested in. So the next slide, we're looking at half cent sales tax revenue. We've uh, been fortunate the past few years that our sales tax, half cent sales tax revenues have been increasing by about 6% per year. And a big piece of that is because Pasco County's population is growing faster than the population of other counties in the state. And as you know, the sales tax revenues is based on population, not necessarily the amount of sales tax generated in a particular area. So the past few years, we've been collecting about 6% increase in our sales tax revenues, and we anticipate that that will increase in, in 2020. We have... Those, those are population. They're not address dependent. Yes, sir. I know. <laughs> we don't want to get into that. <laughs> That's a separate presentation for another day. <laughs> We're going to get a separate bag. Among Calm down. Right? Calm down. Yeah. So our ambulance <laughs> service fees, as you can see, transport fees have been increasing by about 2% per year. And that's about where we see them in the next few years at, at growing at that rate. County share revenue is another large revenue, generates about $16 million a year. This, in addition to sales tax, we also get a cut of the state uh, cigarette tax. So for that reason, the county share revenues are not increasing quite as quickly as sales tax, but still increasing at 5% per year. And so we believe that 5, 5.5% five for this guaranteed entitlement would be uh, not out of reason for 2020. Here's where we talk about, so we had the new revenues, here we talk about some potential new expenditures. Of course, we have phase three of the library where we're going to extend the library hours for, I think there's two more libraries that need extended their hours to where they were pre-recession levels. There's a market study now looking at the uh, salaries of county employees to our surrounding competitors and to see how we're doing with that uh, compensation and classification study. As uh, Commissioner Moore rightly pointed out, now's in good time. Now's the time to start socking away money. And we believe that we can create a plan that in five, seven, ten years to restore that uh, emergency reserve to the 16.7%. And then we have these business plan initiatives that after we've funded these top three things, then we've got these business plan initiatives that our departments will be coming forward with on how they would like to either increase or improve service levels for our customers. And we look at the Municipal Services Fund, we see that these commercial development fees, residential development fees, and zoning permit fees, those are increasing by about 3% per year. And we expect that to continue for fiscal year 2020, just given the amount of uh, building activity out in the community. Again, the Communication Service Tax, this is the 1.58% uh, charge on your phone bill. We've been using this money to fund the Emergency 911 Call Center. And as you can see, the, it's been decreasing by about 2.8% per year from a high in 2009 of $6.2 million to now just around $4.5 million is what we're expecting in 2020. And that shortfall we've been making up with sales tax revenues. So to the extent that this communication service tax is unable to meet the needs of the communication center, we've been making up that loss with, with a half cent sales tax. Here again, foreclosure registry. This is one revenue that we're glad to see decrease. And it's been decreasing, and we continue to see it decrease, and we expect it, it will decrease by 30% between 2019 and 2020. Animal licenses, they're growing very slowly. It's, it's about $800,000 we're collecting in this area, and it's growing at about 1% to 2% per year. Building permit fees, as you can see, building permits... Uh, as you can see in the community, you don't have to guess that building permit fees are increasing at about 5 to 8 percent per year. And uh, with all the activity out there, we don't see any reason why that will not continue. Again, site review fees, plan review fees, these are increasing at about 2 to 3 percent per year as well. Chairman Rowe. 
real quick. Yes. Uh, let me, and I, I can ask Mike this, um, and I just know we talk about business plans and expectations, but I, I know the animal licensing, I know we, uh, we address the fees, I know we got the cat license. I feel about that, but but what's the goal? I mean, if we're averaging two percent, what's I'm just kind of curious. What that would be good for me to see, like okay. what is his goal? And I know it's it's not much more, I don't think, but right. I, I think he's pretty close to hitting it. He's done an unbelievable job out there um, saving animals. So it's, you know, okay. kudos to him and his team. So absolutely, we'll follow up for you with okay. that. Fuel tax revenue. These fuel tax revenues are growing very slowly at about one percent a year, or less than one percent per year. And although the county is increasing in the number of people that are here buying gasoline, their vehicles are becoming more and more fuel efficient, so we're buying less gas. And so that's the reason there's really been very little change in our... Or, or they buy electric vehicle. Or an electric vehicle, yes. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> so tourism development tax. Uh, in oh, <laughs> 2018, we increased the tourism development tax from 2% to 4% to service the loan for the wiregrass uh, sports complex, and so those uh, that's why you see the jump there between 17 and 18, and we continue to see more hotels being built and more customers coming to this area, and so we expect to see this increase by about 3% between 19 and 20. Stormwater assessments, again, in line with new construction. Each ERU is charged $95 per year. And we expect an increase in the stormwater assessment revenues, not because we're changing the amount of the revenue, just because there are more uh, homes and more businesses out there to be paying the fee. So we expect, again, this to be a, a healthy increase for the stormwater assessment. Chairman, sorry, yeah. I don't mean to have you back up, Bob. That's but, right. um, so with the building permit fees and the building inspection permitting fund, how, how much money do they have in reserve right now? And I know the idea is for even not necessarily make money and i know the idea when we when we first year i was in we uh, raised all these fees and i know we've done a great job with with timing of permits uh esther and her folks and don they've done a good job but i'm just curious like where are we at with the idea was not to make money but to look at it right. and say okay maybe we're going to lower some fees eventually uh, i'm just kind of curious how there much is they have a recalibration of those that will be happening this year Okay. But, but I think it'd be good for the board to see how much they have in reserves. So the 104 has met their 16.7%, plus they've also got some money set aside in a capital reserve. There was talk early on of building a, a location in the central part of the county, and so that they've been socking away some money in order to which potentially build out there. Which we're accomplishing the remodel of Half Park. Good deal. Stormwater assessments, as we talked about, water sales. We're expecting an increase of 1.6%. Apologize that this doesn't match your slide. We've, we've made some changes to this since we've sent this out. So we're expecting a 1.6% uh, increase in water sales revenue due to increase in population. Again, the same with uh, wastewater sales, about a 1.6% increase overall in revenues. And then reclaimed water sales, 8.2%. As you go down Moon Lake Road, you've seen the laying of new pipe and things for the reclaimed water. And so as infrastructure becomes more available for folks to use, we expect this uh, to increase 8.2%. This is also changed from yeah, what mine you, says 15. You, exactly, yes. We've, we've updated these slides since they've been sent out. So it's 8%, 8.2%. That's the correct number. We're going to use 82 and up. That's correct. I, mean, I kind of like, okay. 15 is even better. Well, that's my point, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, you know, that's growing. Uh, is, uh, that's growing is given to the subdivisions that have reclaimed water available to them. So, I mean, that's a flat. Which slide? That one? Yeah. Is that, isn't it your packet? No, I have it. Okay. So, so this is the one where we actually had a bunch of text on here and we deleted it all because the, it, it, I think if you've been watching the national economy discussion, it's a pretty mixed bag right now. Uh, you have a bunch of people, economists think, we're headed for a slowdown. A lot of it is just pegged to that, that probably be the longest recession expansion on record, um, you know, here later this year. I went to a TBBA thing. They brought the National Home Builders guy in, and he expects, na so this is a national number, by the end of 19 to 20 to be not necessarily negative, but really, really close. 
by the end of this year and on a national basis in the you know like 0.3 percent point four percent GDP growth not necessarily going negative now that said that's a national what's happening in Florida and in Pasco County so I think everybody there great on national but there's things happening in Florida that are helping Florida stay stronger longer during this recession there's a lot of noise out in the environment right now on that. Talk about the fundamentals are exceedingly strong right now in the economy. Um, and then he quoted one of the, the old Federal Reserve chairman, I think it was during Reagan's term, about you know that you know expansions don't don't die natural causes. The Fed kills them through interest rating. I think it's just something we're going to watch and see what happens over the next. You need know, to watch it, but there is some discussion in the market right now of, of a potential slowdown later to 21. We'll see if we see it in fact, Florida like it like it oh wait but we're, we're keeping our finger to the, to the pulse. Um, but again you get five economists in the room with opinions of what's going to happen so at least right now. Mr. Chairman? Yes. You know as long as California and New York are doing what they're doing they're driving people away from those states and they're coming here. I mean, across the nation, a lot of the states are losing population. We're going to continue to gain. The more people understand the great value of Florida, especially the baby boomers are able to sell their homes, they can now move down, which hasn't happened for years. That's going to continue to, to go on for another 10 years anyway. As um, long as we keep doing the things we're doing, uh, I think the president we have is pro-biz. We're seeing jobs coming back to this country. If we can capitalize on any of that, we should be good, but either way, as the nation goes better, we're going to get better. And I think with our, our current governor, the stuff that he's been doing, I, I think we're in great shape for several years to come. Correct. I think the, on the next slide, we kind of make that point of that there's some local specific things positive for us. You know, we're one of the fastest growing counties in the state, state fastest, one of the two fastest growing states in the nation. So, I mean, there's a lot of positive. A lot of that's back to what you mentioned, Commissioner. A lot of the fundamentals in the strong, which encourage people to relocate. So we're we're taking a cautious approach because that's the approach we need. Oh, sure. We're going to stress test the budget to make sure that we're not doing something that we would regret in two or three years. Um, so but keeping an eye kind of on where things are headed and making sure we're in a good place. But it was really the, the point of these two slides is, you know, we're constantly watching just to make sure that we're doing the right budgetary process. I think that is that's all we have. That's all we have. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Want to recess? Okay. Thanks, guys. My pleasure. Welcome. Thank you. So as Dan teed up earlier, <laughs> the uh, two years ago, there was the uh, discussion on uh, stormwater projects and increasing the stormwater fee. And at that point in time, uh, the board authorized uh, the stormwater utility folks to go forward and enter into designs with um, for certain cooperative funding initiative projects with the understanding that uh, the team would come back later to, to discuss how to fund the construction of those. So that is what we are here to do today. Um, just a quick, a quick note, the, the stormwater utility has been in, um, in, in existence since the late 2000s, and, and over that time it has steadily grown and, and consisted mainly of a lot of maintenance uh, type of activities. Uh, as well as um, putting together uh, and understanding the, the amount of assets that the, that the stormwater uh, division owns, operates, and has to maintain. You know, we, there was really no approach to that previously up, up until that time. So uh, they've, they've made a lot of significant progress. And the important thing to note here is down at the bottom, the Southwest Florida Water Management District CFI project designs. And those are a series of projects that we entered into cooperative funding agreements with the Water Management District. And those designs are currently underway. When we talk about stormwater, I think it's important to, to um, really assess what the level of service is that we're, that we're referring to. In essence, we want to ensure no flooding of structures during a 100-year storm event. At, at, at that point, uh, 
flooding, you know, a little bit of flooding is probably okay. So, for example, you want your arterials uh, and your major exit routes uh, to be clear during, during an event. But collector and local roadways, it's okay to have water on them. Obviously, if we were to try to design and construct systems that would handle 100 percent of the water 100 percent of the time, uh, it would be completely cost prohibitive. Um, and a lot of new developments already meet these standards. These are the standards from the Land Development Code, I believe. But uh, we have a lot of legacy areas in this county that, that can't meet these standards and that continue to flood. When we talk about level of service of our, of our stormwater team, uh, with an A representing being completely proactive and able to do everything that, uh, that you need to, and F being absolutely doing nothing, uh, we would, I would say that we are in a, in a C to C minus range, whereas we can plan projects and, and execute those that are of a, of a high priority nature. Um, we meet our permit requirements. We don't exceed, but we don't fail either. And then, of course, we are currently in a, in a response base. In other words, when a complaint comes in, that's, how, that's, that's when we can take care of a problem right now. So a very, very reactive basis when it comes to operations and maintenance uh, activities. And then when you look at uh, rehabilitating existing infrastructure, on, on average, we're, we're touching a piece of infrastructure every 74 years. Now, for concrete, it's probably not a problem, but for galvanized metal culverts and things like that, that, that could be a problem. Those are just average figures. Historically, when the uh, stormwater utility fee was implemented back in 2007, it was, it was kicked off at a rate of $47 per ERU, and that generated $11 million. And that went to some maintenance activities. It also went to developing a stormwater inventory. Obviously, when you, you know, as part of any asset management program, understanding what you have and how much of it you have uh, helps, you, helps you make smarter decisions along the way. Um, eight years later, it was increased by $10 to, to continue that effort. And then in 2017, as, as you are aware, the fee was increased to $95. Uh, to address additional culvert cleaning and replacements. And also a portion of that money was set aside to fund the design only of certain cooperative funding projects. More specifically, staff at that time presented uh, a proposal for an additional $77 per ERU to fund the, the actual capital of, of, those, of those projects. They're kind of summarized here at the time. Uh, we proceeded with engineering, design, and permitting, and as I stated before, the engineering, design, and permitting is underway. However, some projects will be ready for construction in fiscal year 20, 21, and 22 as, as we move ahead. So it's time for us to start looking at how do we, how do we fund those projects. This is just a, a high-level summary of, of those projects and where we stand today. The bottom line is, is um, based on current designs, based on where, where we see the program, benefit cost ratios, et cetera, we estimate that we need approximately $45 million in construction funding to execute those projects. You'll notice here that um, many of these projects are cooperatively funded, which means we pay half, the Water Management District pays half. You'll notice some of them qualify for FEMA assistance, which is even better. That helps stretch our money. But the more important thing to note is that of the $45 million, we have to front that money. That is, that is a cash requirement. Um, because the CFI and the FEMA money work on a reimbursement basis. And it can take several years for us to see that money ultimately flow back into, the, into, the, um, uh, into our funds. Chairman. Yes, sir. Mike, and I know I asked this question. Explain to the board how long it takes us to get, because most of these projects are Swift Mud mm -hmm. partnership funding. How long is it going to reimburse from Swift Mud? So typically, if, if everything is going well, so typically Swift Mud will not re reimburse you for your design funding until you enter construction. So a lot of your design funding is, is sort of on your own up until you issue a notice to proceed. Generally speaking, I mean, we plan for on a cash flow basis for looking at money at the, at the end of a project. However, if we get a cycle going with, with, uh, with the Water Management District, typically <coughs> an invoice comes in by the time we process it, get it back anywhere from 90 to 120 days if it's if it's working good that's on a per invoice basis so so there's there's a four to six month lag typically in getting getting that cash flow back in and it's it's project specific and again you get into the accounting of it there there can be some uh, some interesting things 
This just shows these projects by district, watershed, and, and location in the county. And really the point here is to show that although these projects are, are centered, they're, they're, they're centered in some areas, you know, we believe that stormwater is kind of a countywide issue, and especially when you start looking at the watersheds. Different watersheds contribute to flooding that, that come, come and manifest themselves downstream in some of our coastal areas or even in some of our landlocked areas. Um, and, and as you can see, they, they run across a lot, of, a lot of lines throughout our county. So really what, what we want to seek discussion from the board today on is, is really looking at two things. Number one, the, the current stormwater utility fee is a, is a countywide assessment. And the, the question would be for these particular CFI projects, the execution of this capital, how do we, how do we go about um, generating that, uh, that revenue? Is it a, a countywide approach? In other words, do we increase the $95 per ERU fee? And we, we could, well, the second question then is if we were to do that, by how much? Um, other approaches that the board has taken in the past, looking at MSBUs, uh, so looking at very specific uh, issues, um, as well as, uh, you know, another idea would be on a, on a watershed issue. Each of these comes with a various uh, array of relative administrative costs. Obviously, uh, a countywide assessment would carry a lower administrative cost than managing specific MSBUs, for example. Um, as well as we look at schedule impacts. There's certain, certain rules and things that, that one must follow when, when executing each of these. As well as the, the ability to fund the project, which is, which is also uh, a strong consideration to be made uh, when you look at, um, especially when you consider how to raise that money. And I, and I say that because how you can raise that money if you were to directly assess um, um, on a, on a pay-as-you-go basis versus uh, bond financing it's going to it's it's going to look differently depending on which which assessment method uh, we choose. So, moving off of uh, the team's recommendation and thought process that stormwater is a countywide issue, we we looked at how do you fund this particular program on a countywide basis. Essentially, there's there's two options, which is a pay-as-you-go model, which is basically cash in, cash out. At 45 million, if we were to raise the assessment for fifth, by 56 dollars per ERU for three years, we, we would be able to fund fund that program. This would represent the lowest cost of capital because obviously we're not going into debt. The other two options are, are basically varying forms of debt. One would be a bank loan. Again, the term of a bank loan you can get now for anywhere from 15 to 20 years. Uh, slightly higher cost of capital than pay-as-you-go because there is interest. However, the estimated assessment would drop to $15 to $20 per ERU if, if we were to follow that approach. Bond financing, again, up to 30 years, uh, potentially the highest cost of capital because you are paying for that over time, uh, with an estimated assessment value at about $14 to $15 per ERU um, on, on that model. So again, when uh, as as staff we're we're looking for feedback from the board on on an assessment approach. Again, we've we've put forward that a countywide assessment would would be preferable. Um, and then again, which funding option? Although it says bond financing there, I think really it comes down to pay as you go or debt. We would want to look at the particulars. Our stormwater utility really doesn't have a credit history, and so having to build that. There, there can be restrictions and things when it comes to bond financing, um, and, and we, we will continue to flesh those things out. But it's important to understand, you know, the, the original model when, when it was brought forward at $77 per ERU um, was kind of a pay-as-you-go model. And again, our, our team has been able to, to, to run, run designs and, and relook at those numbers and kind of whittle that number down to $56 per ERU on a pay-as-you-go model. Um, but again, we would, you know, if you look at debt financing, you know, typically those who benefit are the ones who are, who are paying for it, right? So if you were to charge $56 per ERU for three years, uh, the folks that are, you know, occupying that, that business or unit would, would pay that. If they moved on, there would be, you know, the, the next guy is benefiting from that. So there are some benefits, pros and cons of that, but uh, that is what we would like to try to get some discussion and, and input from the board on. And, and so while 
Most of these projects are in the design phase. They're actually pretty early. They're, I'm not sure. Any no, no, yeah. No. So, so even the assessments there are a little fluid. And as we learn more, like I say, Maggie Valley, some of those could come down. Correct. Could come down substantially if you find some different ways to do things with some of them. So, but don't get fixated on that. What we really need, because that would ultimately just change the ultimate assessment, right? What we really need from the board, direction-wise, it is how do we assess? You know, and then what if if decision is made to go with an assessment? Then what type of financing do you want to look at? Do you want to look at pay as cash basis or bond financing? Now, if if the board would prefer to do these by MSBU, well, that's a whole different discussion because we still have to pay cash up front to do the project, and then we assess that to the people in the MSBU for 20 years would have to have the cash up front so you still have to figure out how you come up with the cash if you did the MSBU approach so but what we need to do now is we're, we're getting ready to be you know in 2020 we could start construction on some of these products if we had the cash available and now obviously the one option that's not on here is to do nothing which is always an option we could do no raise and not and not do anything of these capital projects. I mean, but that is, that's, that's always an option, right? So, you know, our finish the designs on an individual basis decide versus another option. So, but we, what we need today is some guidance because we're, again, we're in the budget process. We have these agreements both with Bookmud and FEMA on these projects. We need some guidance on how to go forward to execute these. Or, or it's the board's pleasure, not. So, Mr. Chairman? Yes. You know, way back in Oakville when I first got elected, we had stormwater issues that were going on, and I, and I pushed staff to go and put the stormwater utility in place. When it got in place, everybody was afraid of it. When we put it in place, everybody saw we were doing something. And again, we're rated F across the board. They saw we put a plan together. Then we took the next step. And this board, I give them tremendous credit for two years ago raising it up, what we had to go do. Now that we're aligned with the swift mud funding, and these projects are across the county, I think we do need to go across county. Because when one part of the county suffers, the other parts yeah. do as well. So I mean, let's take care of this situation. I look at numbers a little differently as far as, the, as how to go. If you can avoid a 15 to 20 year payment or a 30 year payment and get it done in three years, I think you're ahead of the game. Uh, and Dan, I'm, I'm glad you brought up as far as like Magnolia Valley goes. Uh, Iron Bark's another one that I think there's better alternatives, and we, we get a little bit more information, we can take a look at it. But I'll tell you, with Iron Bark itself, which is my district, remember we've had years and years, I know you were there, all the flooding that happened out there. Yeah. Since we put those pipes in the ground and those pumps on the ground, for two years running now, they haven't flooded out. The situation of the geographic structure of that area, the water just doesn't naturally flow where it should flow to get out. There's a, there's a trench that runs on State Road 52 near where the fire station is going to be, I have never seen water in that thing. I don't know how or why if it ever goes to Bear Creek, but if it goes, it's got to go under, under, underground because it doesn't go on a natural flow the way it was designed. That water that we use in that old utilities pond works great. We pumped it for a week straight after a big storm. It didn't even affect 20, 30 percent of the whole project of capacity that we had there. So that's something that I know they got a big number in there for like over $4 million. I'm going to tell you, as a, as a commissioner from the area, I'm comfortable letting that sit as we do these other things first, if we did some later on. Magnolia Valley, I've got two different contracts that have come to me that both would like to take a look at doing that project. Between the peat that's in there, talking to people that are in, in the business, there's great value with the soils that's there. Uh, the drainage, the more we can just pull out of there, we're better. I think we can start like a mining operation, protect the whole area, and actually not have to spend money on it, but we might even make money getting rid of the dirt. And their motivation would be to get rid of the dirt, could create some tremendous capacities. And after that, maybe we can go look at other things to get done. But those are like two projects come to mind. But again, to be a short answer for what Dan was asking for me, I think the countywide and the uh, pay as you go coming up is, is the ultimate way to go. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Moore? So I think one of the things we need to do, and you, and you just brought up a couple projects, is look at each of these one by one, too. So you brought up. You made a good point with Iron Bark after some of that work was done. You haven't seen it flooded. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I, mean, I was out there too, and yes, yeah. and that whole area, and mm -hmm. it's all what what uh, what happened, especially that that first year. 
um, that we after we came into um, to office. Um, I think we need to look at these. Yeah, definitely project by project. And we, well, what? And here's the question for everybody: What about the areas in the neighborhoods that currently have MSBUs for stormwater projects? There's already neighbors that have MSPUs for stormwater projects. So do we? You you should have an MSPU, but the other shouldn't. I mean, and I'm just asking this as a whole. I mean, so what differentiates these other neighborhoods from these areas? They get a pass and they don't? That's just a question. So, I mean, there was lots, so, and some of these have been in place for, 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 for many years, right. I mean, before, you know, some of us came around, but um, that's a question I guess you got to ask out loud. So, of all these, if we look at these projects, um, which ones have water in the roads? Which ones have water that have actually gotten into homes? Yeah, I, got, I messed that question, so. <laughs> yeah. Sure, sure. And, and, and I do have staff here that can yeah. discuss very specific projects. You'll notice that each, each project comes with, with what's referred to as a benefit-cost ratio or a cost-benefit ratio. Um, and, and typically, anything over a one is, is considered um, um, a viable type, type project. Obviously, the higher the ratio, the better. Um, and, and as we continue design, we, we flesh that out because we're, 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 looking at, we're looking at certain things. For example, Magnolia Valley was at a 0 0.6, but as we undertake design and, and study, we anticipate that benefit-cost ratio to go up. And so those are all factors that factor into that. So that's, that's the purpose of, of that benefit-cost ratio, is to make sure that we are providing more benefits than, than what it is going, going to cost us now, so specifically. For, yeah, specifically. So, I mean, I, I know we... And, you know, I'm not saying spend a, a ton of time on each one, but Magnolia sure. Valley you brought up right now. So since um, we took over the pump and, and it's working now and mm -hmm. maintained by the county, how much better is it there? So I'll defer to the public works staff to talk about conditions. Right. Is there, uh, there's the pump project, which uh, we have existing pumps, which as you know, we'll be replacing it, and there's a bigger project. Uh, in terms of the using the pump, yes, you know, there hasn't been any flooding, as we, as we know, because the water is being pumped out. Okay. But there's this bigger project over that property out in that design, so we have two separate things. Right. But there hasn't been any flooding. No, there hasn't, but, you know, I think it's also a function of, in terms of uh, the climate, you know, so it's not been raining heavily right. well the last um, storms just, for example yes. the last two events we had. Yeah. Well, right. they've yeah. seen street flooding okay. yeah that's what i'm asking yes okay storm is a probability based business and sure. I mean, right. it's all based on probabilities and you can you know, what year like 2018 which was a wet year but the storms weren't of a magnitude that no. would cause significant flooding right. but it was a wet year right right, right. It, or you can have a year that has storms that mm -hmm. roll in that that it caused flooding, but just because part of the the twenty percent, thirty percent design process is to validate that there are valid projects. I mean, Slip Mud looks at that at the thirty percent stage, and they won't even go move forward if it doesn't meet a cost benefit right. ratio on their standpoint. So, so life safety so being number one, the, life safety right. being number one, obviously, um, property so damage, property da life, life safety, property damage. Yeah. So those kinds of things are all part of that. Right. So when we look at these projects, how, how do we rank those when it comes to that? Go, oh, no, go ahead. So, I mean, you made it, again, so, just go back to the point you made. Again, when, so for you each know? of these projects, and then there are others more behind this, uh, we went through the task of ranking each of the projects. This is just an example. I'll pass this around. Of what we went through and the criteria we looked at. So we uh, independently... Okay, Elmo. Is Elmo working? We can get that up on the screen if you want. Yeah, that way everybody can see it. We've got a lot of staff here and such. You can go ahead and throw it up there. Let me get that. Grab that. Well, let's put it on the screen. Yeah, yeah. Here, pass it back down and put it on the screen. we got more coming or something. There you go. Okay. And that way everybody can see it. Bigger fonts, too. Big, oh, that's bigger fonts? <laughs> <laughs> we need bigger fonts. I don't have to do that. Right. Thank you. Back to you know, we're still in the study phase, which means 
you could end up with revi re refining the project anyway, in, in where that's part of the process. And uh, you know, the, I know Plantation Palms, MSBU, y'all just approved to help solve the, the, the stormwater issue out there. Um, you know, Magnolia Valley, the golf course was bought as an MSBU. Uh, Timber Green. Timber Oaks. Timber Oaks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where is the... You know, was an MSBU for both okay. the land and, and the... So, you know, that's... I'm kind of curious why, Chairman, if you don't mind, why the Magnolia Valley pumps on here. That was already funded. It shouldn't even be on there. It should be done by now, but we already... That was all set aside back when we went through the MSBU process. The pump should not... That was all we had funding for all that. I'm just kind of curious why it's there. If somebody can answer that, would be great. Justin. No, it was both. It was fixing the concrete, the slab that was falling down. It was replacing both pumps. That was part of the the, the board agreed upon from the beginning was replacing the that. diesel pump as well as the electric pump, which we've done the electric. We're still waiting on the diesel because the all that was part of that process. There wasn't two stages. It was all part of the exact same project. Yes, I think what he meant was on, on the list of projects, there's the Magnolia Valley pump and then there's the... Uh, but I'm just saying you have this down as, as, as part of an increase. It should not be included in part of an increase because we've already budgeted for that back well, two this years ago. Is, so this list was, was taken through with the stormwater team and looking at, at the budget and the financing. Now, bear in mind, Justin's team has had this for, you know, not an entirely long time going through that. Uh, and we did, we did actually cull projects out of this. Uh, that to ensure that that double counting wasn't occurring, I will go ahead and ask staff to go back and, and re-verify that. But but we are pretty confident that the, the funding numbers in here are correct. But but I will I'll formally respond I to am, you. I am 100 percent positive that this board, I, when we voted to move forward, was for again the diesel the diesel pump was supposed to be done a year and a half ago, yeah. and the reason it wasn't well, done is because we'll, of the slab. We, we will come back called. and yeah, we'll come back. I will tell you what that 800 thousand is actually for. And uh, if and whether or not it, how it how it falls into that place. And then the Port Ritchie alternative outfall. I know we've discussed this. It's definitely not going to be a four hundred fifty thousand dollar project. The yeah, Port Ritchie gonna... outfall. I so, believe some of so that is tied back into the Maggie, Maggie Valley, Maggie Valley yes, project. Yes, the projects are tied together. That's actually being studied right now. Come up with but what is the board is needs the right to know that because if I'm the board, I'm th and I, I kind of. But they're thinking it's to dig out. Magnolia Valley only. I mean, we've got to buy right away. We, we right. found those. Oh, yeah, it's more. Found those additional culverts under Ridge Road. That's going to be the idea because there is a lot of flooding. I mean, and my issue, quite frankly, with these fees, somebody like the Congress Skate Rink guy that <coughs> gets hit with all these ERUs and he still floods. Um, he did, he has in the last couple of years. We've got lucky. But this Port Ritchie outfall will help him and will alleviate that flooding. Correct. So it just. You know, um, anyhow, I just I want to make sure we're accurate on here, and the pumps absolutely, positively should not well, be on there. And, and again, if these things are in the 20, 30 percent design, that's that's the level of confidence I have in the estimate. They're still real rough, mm -hmm. especially if they're in the, where the Maggie Valley project is. It's in the study, the basin study. But the first. pump was different. The, again, the yeah, pump was supposed to be yeah, done no. two years yeah, ago. The only holdup the, is the slab started to fall. We had to fix it. That's the holdup. Yeah. Talking about the big picture of the big project. Okay. That was that was a part of the the study solution yes, doing right now. Correct. What the improvements need to be to actually fix that problem. The pump we basin. already had engineers before the load. Yes. Yeah, but it shouldn't be on here for new funding. I mean, you guys are telling us you need seven hundred ninety-eight thousand from us, and you're adding it to that forty-four. We're gonna go check it for the bond we'll or for the. I, I will I will validate those yeah. numbers. The tax personal. increase, you know. So, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. And, I, and I agree with Commissioner Wells. I think that thing was taken care of from the get-go. We had a temporary fix with the electric. Then we had this one here ready to go. And other than the slab, it should be this. That number should be different. So, the, you know, the the individual looking at each, each one of these projects is going to be correct, critical. Um, Quish Drive, down up old, um, uh -huh. was it Old Post Road? 
we dug that out uh, on one side where the big retention area was. We dug into the canal side uh, as far as we could, and, and Brantford did a great did a great job. S team did a great job getting it together, getting a contractor in there. And I think it was like eight grand. We sent we, we dug out four truckloads of dirt down that canal. If we can clear that canal out, which comes and takes all that water over from the skating rink all the way over from Magnolia Valley, it's like you talked about when we said, look, I don't mind putting stormwater money into it on canals if we're going to go make the water flow better. That's like a classic piece of that. And if those culverts under Ridge Road need to be cleaned out too, I don't know if they're on this part or not, but... Again, the LOSHA study in that whole basin, mm -hmm. which would include all that. There's additional culverts under Ridge Road that aren't open, that were built because thinking we're going to need it, which was smart, um, but but we still have to buy right away across the road and Correct. then to connect it. From Magnolia? Correct. Right. But yes, is that yeah, by the trailer park that always floods yes. there. Um, there is additional culverts. I don't know how big, but they're pretty big culverts. I and it happened to be, a, I, I saw happenstance coincidence with the past president of that mobile home park. And after we had dug that out, when we had the storm surge coming in, he said, we were so worried about it, and then the water levels never moved because the water was cleared out. So I know we get solutions out there, and some of these solutions could be real cheap, like with the pipe we put in the ground at, at Iron Bar, you know, for, what, $132,000 worth of pipe and two pumps going out there? They haven't flooded in two years. But so I'm, I mean, I'm, but I'm not sure if that solved the long-term systemic. Issue. Well, it solved uh, the and problem I, in two years. I don't know. If that's what it, our and, firms are looking at. Yeah, I'll give you this: Holiday Hills, that area there, that's a long-term fix we're looking to doing between putting the bigger pipe in to let it flow, leaving the other pipe there still. I don't want to take that out, but letting that go, but then fixing that small cover behind the Gulfy Mall, that is a long-term fix that does need to happen. I'm just saying, if we're looking at putting these things in that need to get done right away. The, ge the geographic structure of Ironbark, the way it sit, all the water's down below. We're pumping it uphill. You're not going to be able to collect too much water the way it flows. Just There's no way to get it there except to go to that spot anyway. And if you've got the pumps in place, that water's coming down the hill. Matter of fact, a lot of the hill that goes up way from the top of that pond on the far eastern side, when that comes down, that water flows all the way down, hitting every one of those eight streets, all the way to getting that spray field that's over by the FGA, which we're taking over. Now, all that water is going down to that area, which now, by taking over FGA with the aqua system, we're going to solve that problem. But that's all in the same area where this water is coming from. So if we're going to start collecting that now, we're going to be in much, much better shape. But again, sometimes these little fixes can go. I mean, we, we cut out that weir down in, at BMP 5A, down in Trinity, and talking to the uh, Homeowner Association president. For years, he sat for 12 years. He was in meetings about what we're going to do fix there. He says, in the last two years, just that cutting, cutting that wear down two feet, he says, we haven't had an issue. So now they're ready to go actually get the roads fixed. So sometimes these big money things our big engineers come up with aren't the best fix to go through. And if we're going to try to do this, I think the most efficient way, getting these bonds where we don't have to go to the bonds or the, all, all the MSBUs, if we can be, be more efficient strategically fixing what we've got to fix, I think we'd be better off. Chairman, oh, yes. And here's here's my thing, and I've said it today. So we're looking at if we take the cooperative funding from Swift Mud, we take the FEMA funding. You've got down our 44 million we need. Really, the number's like 16 million is what we need if we get all the matches. And my thing is, what, again, this is this this will be the third time we've raised taxes on these folks. Last time I was told we weren't going to ask again. That was all we needed, Commissioner, when we got back in 2017. Again, you guys, again, you know where, where I feel with it. I love you guys, but it's, we, we should have known the exact number back then. We're not having to address this again. But I just want to make sure the board understand what's, what's the real number. Like, it doesn't make sense for us to go out for a bond on $44 million that technically we're going to get back half. Um, and I get we want to put it in projects, but I guess what is that number so we're being, and we've been as transparent as we've ever been um, with, the, with the residents, which is awesome. But the number is really 16 million, if you look at it, that we need. So, do we have to pull out a difference out of reserves for 120 days to help fund until we get the money back? That's kind of my point. Can we be a little more creative when we get this number? It's a big number for some of these businesses. It's based off square footage. Mm -hmm. I think ETR used, what, 2,000 square foot? I mean, the guy, the Congress guy, for instance, and he's one that came to me, small business owner, got hit with 10, whatever the number was. It was a huge number. He wasn't expecting. And I'm like, this guy trying to survive and he's I think the challenge with pulling out of reserves is most 
restrictions on them. And mm -hmm. so if you pull it out of, and I'll just. I'm just throwing out an idea. I just, true number is the true number is about 16 well, million. Well, but the problem is you got to pay cash and then get reimbursed. And so you, you. FEMA reimbursement's not going to happen in 120 to 180 days. Right? Right. So that's that's going to be a lot longer lead time on that. If you pull out a reserve fund, there are going to be restrictions on that reserve fund where you another another enterprise because you pulled out of their reserve fund because they that money is set aside reserves set there for the, the bond ratios or whatever that that there's a there's a need there for that we don't just sit money over the side. you know so we got to be careful doing that you know so um, you know and, and yeah all these numbers are going to change because as we get through a decision all these numbers are going to be a little different. Mr. Moore? Okay. So, um, Bass Lake, that area, well, which project is that on here again? The Bass Lake area. Obviously, that. There's yeah, a couple. There's a couple that affect that. Obviously, being out there and seeing that, yeah. very serious situation. That's when you. That's a situation where you have houses underwater and people having to is, cannot is, traverse back and forth to the Is Hidden Lake in that part of that? Yes. It should be, yeah. I they're pull saying the water back. And they're saying okay. Hidden Lake, if I can uh, speak for our engineers, but they're saying it would it would relieve a foot of water in the Bass Lake area. Yeah. So I mean, it's a great it's a great design and, and really um, that's going in the right direction. We're What's actually right now in a hole pattern because we got some monies waiting on well, FEMA to give us a grant. So well, what's the other one that ties to PHSC the berm. Yeah, PHSC is also part of that. Yep. All of their separate projects, they both impact yep. that area. Yeah. So why would that be? And just curious to talk about rankings again, right? I agree with you, Commissioner. So yeah. Hidden Lakes in two, and then PHSC is team. But and again, remember that first system that came through, right? Not long after we got, I think, elected this that summer, right? Was that summer? Um, that area was pretty bad. So why is? I, mean, yeah, I think again, it depends on the, the magnitude of the impact. So one could have an impact of a foot on the freeboard, of the, and the other one may, may be a, a different impact and only impact part of that basement. So that, you'd have to dive into the, the details of that impact. And so, Commissioner, if I could real quick. Yes, sir. On what Commissioner Moore just said, you know, these are folks that their houses are underwater. Um, you know, the berm project, the way it works now, it comes across Ridge into Hidden Lakes, down into Bass Lake, back across Ridge, back out through Tanglewood back out to Cubulus where this burn project will keep it going on that side of Ridge out to the Cubulus. Mm -hmm. It just makes sense. Yeah. Um, it's going to relieve it. And I don't disagree. I think it should be right up there with the Hidden Lakes project. They should be well, together. Because yeah. um, they're going this through the, a, you know. This, this, this is a, yeah, this is a staff review of the projects based on a lot of criteria. Yeah. And, and just because they're reviewing them all at one ranks. time. <laughs> the key is these are all approved projects where Correct. we have property funded agreements in place already it's not as if we're going to draw a line and only do half of them yeah the proposal here is that we're going to do all these i understand we just had to you know they went through and did a pretty detailed work through of, to try to come up with a ranking that the big thing is the number at the bottom and again some of the were in the early stages of basin analysis and design which could come down they also could go up depending on what we need and the impact that has. You know. But I guess my point, Commissioner's point, is why rank them? Because you've got, you know, you're telling me the Port Ridge, Port Ritchie Alternative Valley Falls connected with Magnolia Valley, but you got Magnolia ignore Valley the, down towards the bottom. They should be ignore, together. Ignore the ranking. But I mean, but you showed us why they're ranked, and you gave us them ranks. So. Well, it's kind of crazy. But it's not a real rank. No, because the key there is that bottom number, that 45 million. In order to go forward on these projects, well, well, that's the, that's what we need yeah. to make those happen. And, and, and listen, I, 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 yes, I get it. You got to get you're trying to sell us in a way on an alternative, and here's the number. But at the same time, you know, we answer to the constituent, we answer to the taxpayers, and whatever decision we make here, they're going to know how we came up with that conclusion, and. If, example again, this is what you put together. If Hidden Lake is attached to PHSC for Bass Lake, I think somebody's going to wonder why, why do you have it ranked in? Are you going to do the projects at the same time? 
we got to be able to answer those questions because we, as commissioners, are the ones that are going to get the calls. Yeah, well, in those projects, you would yeah. not do it at the same time because you get permitting pass. Both of them need permits, and you would get them as you get the permits, you would do the work. I mean, both of them have, if correct me if I'm wrong, pretty substantial environmental permitting processes with them. And so, you know, if you link them together, then one's going to wait on the other one. Yeah. Whereas if you, if you broke them apart, both have cooperative funding agreements in place. Mm -hmm. If you got one permit in 2020, you'd move forward with that one while you would wait to get the other permit. You wouldn't link them together. Otherwise, you'd delay, you could delay both. Right. So you leave them separate. All of these are part of our agreements with this, with Swiftly. I mean, so we all have cooperative funding agreements in place. It's just a matter of how do we, how do we pay for construction? I, and again, we know. Mr. Another, can I follow up? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Okay. So we talked about the districts um, and the watersheds in those districts. Cypress Creek, where does that water run to, typically? Is your basin manager here? Here. So if, there you if, go. If you could show, hey, what's going on, bud? <laughs> if you could show, maybe if we could put up the map go up there. The map. On the PowerPoint. Yeah. Projects by districts and watersheds. Because the watershed is up there. Uh, to answer the question while we're waiting for that, Cypress Creek runs to the Hillsborough River. Yeah. Okay. Uh, pretty much north, south through the center of the county. And I know the answer. I just wanted you. Oh, okay. To, I to, <laughs> no, but I wanted you to answer for, right. for everybody else. Okay. So, again, w Cypress Creek, which of these projects does Cypress Creek have an effect on? I don't possibly have an effect on it, right. if any. All right. Basin study on that one. Yeah, Cy Cypress you know, projects that would provide relief in the Cypress Creek watershed um, are in outlying years. They're, they're not, you know, immediate projects. We don't have cooperative funding. We right. did submit. But we did have any of these projects? No. Right. But we did submit a project for FY19 funding, and it was turned down for cooperative funding. That was in the Cypress Creek watershed. Again, just going back to your initial conversation, and what you stated was it's a countywide issue. So that watershed, just saying, does not affect any of these projects. Does it have an impact on any of these projects here? So in reality, you can say it's countywide. If that watershed doesn't have an impact on this project, then it's really not countywide. Again, just being transparent. I think if you look at the number of watersheds throughout the county, Cypress Creek is one example. And obviously, as Mr. Carey pointed out, there are flooding issues within, within various watersheds that, that can come out. Um, and again, what you see here is, is a line of projects that two years ago we were looking at as our priorities. That doesn't mean, and what you don't see here, is, is a line of other projects that are beyond that. So when we talk about the additional money that comes back uh, into the, you know, from the reimbursement, Commissioner Moore, I'm sorry, Commissioner Wells, you pointed out, let's just use the $6 million number. There are still monies that can either be reinvested into additional priorities, or if it's the pleasure of the board, depending on how we do it, you can refund debt and you can do other things with, with those dollars. What we have is a cash problem to be able to execute two years ago what we entered into agreements mm -hmm. to do. And, and, and again, there are, there are additional projects below the line that, you know, perhaps Donald, as you point out, uh, you know, could affect Cypress Creek or, or, or other watersheds that we're not even talking about here Right, today. but we're, again, so we're, but we're not talking about those today. Correct. So, so five or six years down the road, are we going to have a similar meeting of this going, we need some more? That's a possibility. You know, I, that's, I, that's what I'm hearing. Because this will fund these projects. Mm -hmm. It's not going to fund projects down the road unless you unless you ask for more. Well, <clears throat> what what you know? As I mentioned, one alternative would be to reinvest the proceeds or the reimbursements into future. The thing about stormwater projects is eventually you you reach a point to where you are in operations and maintenance. Uh, you fix the worst problems, and then you you. You make, a, you make a decision mm -hmm. on how to address or not to address the remaining. If they don't meet the cost benefits, 
perhaps we buy houses instead of doing projects. You know, those are those are those are things as we we continue to refine it. I think you've talked about on the river, right? Yes. So possibly that's probably the one of the better options. Correct. Well, and well, they're just there are areas where you know the fix is a, a multi-million dollar fix, and you only are four homes are in the floodplain. It just makes right. sense to buy those three or four homes and not do the multi-million dollar fix. Now that that still means you're still going to flooding is still going to impact the neighborhood, but it won't be into structures. Because I think you purchased one of them. Iron Heart. Yeah, hold on. Right? Multiple They're homes talking about in Iron But Heart. those people don't want to sell. Oh, they, they, they like living where they live in. Okay. And especially now that the flooding's minimized, guess what? I mean, what about the house that you ran the pipe through or under or in their backyard? Oh, yeah, well, that, that was a separate, yeah, we had to acquire the property so we could have land through which we could run the pipe. Okay. Right. That was over in Jasmine. That, oh, that was, that was Jasmine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and that's that, similar that probably situation. worked out good too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, similar situation. Again, that just reinforces stormwater is probability based. Just because it looks like we solved a problem doesn't mean we solved a long term probability based problem. Well, and I, I, and I, I, we don't it, want to do design here at the table. That's not the intent of the meeting. Right. No, so but, 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 but having that countywide. Forward with this in funding construction or not funding construction. Mm -hmm. You know, and so. This is one batch of projects. The board has said yes. Go to the yes. Go to FEMA and get cooperative funding for right, which is great. We have those agreements in place. We're doing the design. I can't go to construction without the cash to do the projects, and so you know that's the challenge. Back to Commissioner Moore's point, the other projects we're not even there yet because we don't even know what the cost benefit ratio is on those, right. and, and there may be a few that do when we get there in the, but we don't know yet and those may be once we get the process of we put the cash we get reimbursed with and we can do it at that point but we don't we've not gotten there with this the program's in such infancy of, of doing design doing O&M from just two years ago that we're still really cleaning this stuff up thanks, so. thanks. and again I appreciate it. And, I, and I appreciate all the Again, once again, all the work you're putting into this, but it goes down to again full transparency. We need to be transparent yep. with obviously our our constituents. If we're looking at once we do get reimbursed, putting that possibly putting those funds towards additional projects, I think even starting now, we would need to see those projects because that has an impact on what choice, if any, that we make when it comes to these funding options. Well, yeah, yeah, to a certain well, extent, it, well, until we I mean, do the bond edit, it's going to we paying it back for that basin, long. Not, until we do basin studies on every basin in the county, which we're we're close uh, on some right now, close oh, on yeah. some, but we're not on every right one of them. Right. We're not going to know that for a while. And so, if if you're saying, okay, don't move forward with any of these until we come back with a full project list of all the ones we're going to need to do to get where we meet the right levels of service, then we're going to be delaying these construction projects for. for so a that's not that's not what I was saying. What I was. But at the same time, the, the comment was made um, by the team that you could possibly use once that re money's reimbursed out of that forty-four million dollars, the ha the half or whatever, or more than half, I guess, could be cooperative with Swift Mud and then the, the FEMA dollars. They could be poor, put towards future projects. But again, so like Commissioner Wells mentioned earlier, why are we asking for the full forty-four, which you answered, but does that go back into what pot does that go back? Do we reimburse that back to the citizens until? On a project, I think that depends on the board, right? right. Yeah, I mean, and so I mean, it also again, depends on how you want to fund them. You know, <laughs> so it also goes back to how do you want to fund them? If, if to go to Commissioner Mariano's point, if you cash fund them, then you're doing that assessment just for projects, and then at the end of the, we could come back to the list of hey, if if you want to continue it, we could do these, or if you want to reduce it, with these, you know, you that actually sets you up more flexibility going into the future. Because you haven't gone out, but I mean that's one, you know, pro on on how to do it that way. But you're still but asking for the 444 over a three-year period, right? Right. So you're so over and above. We get the we get the cooperative funding reimbursed to us, and then so you then and then we could either you could other projects or you could do something else with it. You could reduce the assessment. Couple years to, to take that into account. Okay, so there's an option. So yeah, you okay, now, that, you just, yeah. now you just brought up a good option, right? So you say now you can reduce the assessment, right? If need be. Again, how do you get that money back to the citizens if it's not going to be utilized? We say we'd reduce the assessment. 
Right. Then we got it. Okay. Well, that's if you did there's cash, an answer. If you cash flowed it. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Yeah. And, and, th and thinking about different projects out there, like Quail Hollow in that area, we just had the spray fields. We just took the pipes and we ran it out up to mm -hmm. 4G Ranch, and we right. got all sorts of investment in that whole project in the Cypress Creek thing. It's already been done. We've already funded it. Everyone's paid for it. So it's kind of like there already for everybody. So it's already kind of like we've, we've already done that project. When I look at the paving assessment program, it's been gone on so long, we have to do everything the same way. We can't change that right now. But we're such at an early stage of this right now, making these moves, that you know, the, the, I, I feel bad for the people at Timber Oaks right now, and we can talk about them, just like plantation palms. Maybe right. there's a better way to take care of what we have going through Swift Mud now, and, I wanted to, and I'll talk more about which two projects I think should be taken out again, but to get that number down. But you can go do that. It's a short-term thing for three years. It's a three-year plan. In three years, we might be able to say, you know what? We can knock this down to 10. Or we can actually say, we're going to take part of that money and going to pay back part of plantation palm money or uh, timber oaks money and kind of lower their MSBU down to try to get rid of that MSBU as well. So that's potentially where you can go. When I look at the Magnolia Valley storage, that's $13.3 million. If I can get two contractors in here to go bid on what they could do to get rid of that dirt, and create the same net effect without having to spend SWIFT money or our money, that frees up a whole bunch of money. If I can, and I will talk to the people at Ironbark, I already have, that if I had to delay them so that we can actually get ourselves to a better situation to reduce that uh, number that's here that, at $56 and get that number down between both those things, I think it's a much more palatable thing to go do on both those projects. And then in three years, when we've gone down the road, we can go relook at it, have these guys back to us and say, you know what? We don't need the 56 anymore. Now we're going to be down to 10, 15, or whatever the number may be to pick up another project that's happened to come up. I think it's an easy way to go. If you do that long-term bond, the money we spend on bonds is, is, would, would you know, just drive up the inefficiency of the whole thing, all the interest. Here we're taking all that away and putting ourselves in position to solve it quick, get it done, and then figure out what's the best thing to do. And it may be instead of that $13 million project, Maybe by cleaning out the end of Quist Drive mm -hmm. for 180 grand, it's going to be a much better investment than spending 13 million. Because now I'm getting the water to go out. Where well, the whole problem with the water is, it's not getting out. I'm I'm solving that issue. It may be a better expense of the money. Is that dirt at Magnolia? Is that sellable? I thought we had to run some tests on that, you're, that you're dirt. End up with areas that you can't be landfill because of arsenic and yeah. But, so, you know. It reduced the cost at Timber Oaks. It did not make the cost go away. Yeah. You still had a pretty substantial cost. So, you know, yeah. This, again, now the board can say, okay, that's fine. We want you to just do $10 million a year. Before, before you go to the deeper, can, I, can I touch that? Can, can I touch on your so question just a little bit? Before you go, can I just touch on that question a little bit to give you an idea? Okay. Part of the dirt on Timber Oaks that they couldn't move off was too expensive to move. They just kept it there. You've got an opportunity to put berms around that whole thing with all the, let's say, the bad dirt around there that you don't have to move off and you still create the storage you want. Oh, yeah. I got you. Uh, I mean, um, the other thing you can do is you can say, okay, we want to pay cash, but we don't want the $56 million number, let's say 30 over three years, so $10 million a year. You go refine it, and instead of doing the program over three years, we do it over five or six or seven. Years. Uh -huh. That's the other option. There's another option. But, I mean, yeah. you, can, you can finesse it a couple ways, or you can say, you know what? We don't want to think about cash on Magnolia Valley until you finish the basin study. We know exactly what that is. So take that number out. So, I mean, so there are some other options we can come up with. Can we borrow from the general fund or for that money coming in our budget? So $44 million is greater than what you have in your general fund fund balance. <laughs> no, but I'm talking about that extra percent we were talking about. What was it? Three point something percent. I'm going to try to build that back up a little bit. But. How much money was that? 3.6 or... To go from oh, the three point six million that was in Mr. Yeah. Gorig's presentation. Yeah, that that'll be potentially new revenue available in, in the general fund in ad valorem. Uh, That's not in near enough to get us through some of those projects with the cash. No, you know, your stormwater. Right. You'd be taking from your ad valorem general fund yeah. revenue yeah. to fund a utility. Okay, I got you. And, you and said that you set the stormwater up as a utility, a countywide utility. Yeah. That's the way you have it set up. Right now. What's okay? Quick okay. question. Yeah. So, What's our bond rating right now? For stormwater, there is none. Because no, as a county. 
Uh, double, double A. Double A. So that's, that's strong, right? I mean, right. That's, that's strong. Better than some of our surrounding counties. Yeah. Could any of this affect that, even though it's a, it's a separate fund or separate enterprise? He's right behind no. you there. Council here, I mean, they can probably provide some information related to. Any, yeah, if anything, we, could anything we do here affect our bond rating? We have a separate enterprise set up for stormwater. Yeah. So it's effectively segregated. Just Water and wastewater are segregated from the general fund as a separate utility. It's, it's solid waste. And, and you have a few other. I would still assume it's, it's attached to the county itself. They look at all that yeah. somehow. I mean, we're yeah. we're the parent corporation of the utility, <laughs> which is a in a sense a, just a another corporation, and we're the. Oh, there we go. Is there any bigger yeah. impact would be? So the I, I the question balance. is: is, is, is the stormwater uh, utility where it's Bond on felt, uh, would that could that positively or negatively impact the county's overall bond rating? I think that's your question. Yes. Sir. You have to come up here though, just so you know, for the clerk. So, so. And introduce yourself. <laughs> yes. Still morning. Yes. Good morning, uh, Brent Wilder, PFM Financial Advisors. Generally speaking, a self-contained financing within the utility mm -hmm. should not um, have an impact on the bond rating of the county because it's a distinct, separate. Separate it in the minds yeah. of the bond holders in the rating agency. Okay. 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 Yes, All right. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Probably a good reason not to blur the wall between general fund and stormwater utility. Also, what I was yeah. mm -hmm. thinking. Right. Yeah. So. Mr. Chairman? Yes. An idea. Commissioner Moore, you, you brought up a good point. You know, what about the people that like plantation palms or timber oaks that have their fees that we've just put in for the MSBU? And everybody's going to pay that base fee that we've got in. But maybe what we should be doing is and getting, getting some new numbers to take, see, figure what the effect would be, is let's go take a look at, for those people that are paying them SBU, and uh, did Magnolia, Magnolia Valley go through for their thing too? Yeah. So yeah. let's say you take those, take those three MSBUs are out there, and out of this, whatever the number comes up to be, obviously less than $56, but whatever that number is, we should give them a credit back so they're not paying yeah. the 57 on top of that, the MSBU for the extra. Yeah, just I, I don't think it'd be a huge effect on the budget, but I think it'd be a fairness, the right way to go. I mean, Kelly Valley is different because their MSB was set up specifically to buy the golf course. It was not set up, and they're paying to retire the debt of buying the golf course. It was not set up to actually do the project itself. And if I recall from what people told me, we actually told the residents you wouldn't pay for the stormwater project. It would be, it would not be done with an MSB. I remember that too. They were told they were not paid for the stormwater project. That's I would not necessarily credit them with that's what I see you're saying. that right now. So, but yeah, I mean, we can look at those alternatives. I mean, I think <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah, you know, the, you know, the the question is, we have these projects that will be ready to start construction in 2020. How? What is the pleasure of the board to fund that, or it, would you like us to? cash flow them over a period of three to six years and not necessarily do them all when they're ready in 2020, but start, which we're going to have to work with our partners because, you know, there's a timing issue on the right. Swiftman side too, right? Yes, those sir. all have a timing issue in the agreement. You know, instead of, say, a 56 number, look at a smaller number and cash flow it over a longer period of time. But instead of doing it over three years, you cash flow it over six or something. Mm -hmm. it takes longer to do it. But it's a smaller number, and by then maybe we refine those numbers. So instead of you know 56 divided by over six, it's it it's a right lower right. number divided by something over a longer period of time. Yeah. So you know, like Maggie Valley through the base of study, so exactly what we need to do, and she come back with a real number. And that's the other option, but you're still talking about really looking for a cash flow basis as opposed to a debt basis. Mm -hmm. Cash flow gives you those lo those alternatives and those that flexibility that debt doesn't. Mm -hmm. Even though debt is from a annual hit is a lower number, it, it locks you into some things that may not give you the flexibility long term that you may want. And, and Dan, if I, I'm sorry, if I may, may add to what you just said, we have one project that just went to construction, uh, Forest Hills, and, and you, you probably haven't gotten word of it. Just uh, Friday, it went to construction. So that's one out of the slate of the FY. 1819 CFI project. Okay. And we have uh, another project, Zephyr Creek 1 and 2, That's which right. is poised to get its permit, so poised to have you know construction documents put out on the street. So 
It, it may go to construction FY19, if not FY19, early FY20. You know, and, and it's a point. It's a point worth mentioning, right? You look at you look at that one project that we were able to fund, and that is, you know, looking. You know, one of the reasons why it's not it's 56 and not 77 is is we've been able to look within those resources to go ahead and fund those projects now without having to to worry about an increase in the assessment. So what Dan says about look, we we can cash flow right now. We generate roughly about four million dollars a year of of additional you know, revenue off of the design side that's not set aside for maintenance activities. Uh, you look at some of the price tags on these projects, it's, it's not a whole lot of money. And so, again, if we were to cash flow it, and again, as we mentioned, we could, you know, have to work with our partners because we do have contractual obligations right. under these CFIs, and the Water Management District does um, encumber and set aside funding based on, based on those schedules, right. and, and they are sensitive to that. So, uh, but it is another option and an alternative that, that we can we can look through. Can I, can I also mention that uh, from the maintenance perspective, we, are, we all know uh, what the issues are in this situation, cash flow, then these issues uh, cause to try to fix something from the maintenance point of view, which is really not making an impact. That will continue for a while. Uh, that tends to frustrate everybody. All right. If you do that, if you do that instead of a fifty-nine, and you do it over six years, you're looking at thirty. Well, basically, I'm not sure because some of these projects, you know, Maggie, thirteen million dollar project, project, because we may be it may be Based, there, yeah. but some of that money is moving downstream. So I, I don't know if you can do the straight math. I see what your what your what your point is to average it out, and I think what Dan said is we'd have to cash flow it, and that that's really the to see where those right. peaks, valleys, and even possibly to consider where reimbursements and those timings you know, scheduled. You, you and as you get into those projects, you're going to find out they the true cost is less than that, or as you go 18 months or so into one of those projects, you find out you're getting return on money coming back from Swift Monk. I mean, yes. You know, I mean, I mean, every every project hits differently, and so as we get right. into construction from the water management district, at, you know, about four months later, we start seeing some pennies coming coming back in. You know that, you know that Can entire we work cash a scenario model. like that and come up with a lot lesser number. Well, there, we we could come up with that scenario. The question would be, what would be realistic? Correct. I mean, I, I just would, you know, yeah. a lot would depend on the water management district and and their agreement with. Right. Because we would have to delay certain projects. Yes. Right. But but to your point, Commissioner, if if we're constructing a project and we're paying invoices, we'll submit those submit invoices to Swift Mud and get a fifty percent reimbursement in the case where we have a CFI agreement. So your your money does start rolling back. You know, right. There's a there's a lag. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Several months. Right? But but I think to your point is, do you make it thirty dollars? Well, I mean, if if the first project out of the chute is a is a fifteen million dollar project, I would probably say that's probably wouldn't work. You'd have to take those larger cash ones. You'd have to fit that in. It, it would be a financial cash flow analysis, is what our yeah. team would have to do. But it's something like what you're talking about. You'd have to take in the larger number and then decrease it as you go. Well, forward. right, and, and in a sense. So, so if, if you don't mind, let me try to. Wrap let me just up touch on one thing real quick. Let I'm me just touch on one th one thing that's very applicable to this. Yeah. Part of the reason this Forest Hills project went through, we get state legislative funding. Just like we talked about for other oh, yeah. things, we could get some state legislative funding. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think we get three list, yeah. future yeah. state reps coming that we can reach out to. There's and some of those that are on the list. I mean, I think it was great potential to actually drive that number down as well. Carl has the bill numbers if you want to know what they are. He has, he has that information. I so, so I'm going to try to summarize what we're hearing and, and wrap up. If you don't mind. What, what I'm hearing is go back, look at a cash flow, <laughs> look what makes sense, really look at a cash funded process, and then back with kind of a, a staggered approach that may be over instead and then see what that looks like now again at that point those priorities do begin to matter because you want to try to do them in the right priority right but and then we need to sit explain to you how we came up to the priorities and show you and that's kind of what I'm hearing but sure yeah and yes sir. real quick I mean we're looking and my thing is again we need it. We need it. Uh, but again, what's the true number? We're, we're generating 25 million today in stormwater, total money in with what the residents are paying. If we have to delay a rehab or something for three months until we get reimbursed, that's kind of my not saying take out of reserves. And I guess another thought too: Have, have we talked to Keith, environmental lands or parks? 
you know, about being creative and working together. Again, I know there's environmental lands property, quite frankly, that we bought that could never be developed, but we did it for the right reasons. It is what it is. But are we talking to Keith and maybe his team saying, hey, can we work together? What's the environmental impact on this? And is it the right throwing it out there? It's not a bad idea to bring him in the loop just to have that conversation. Yeah, where we have right away <laughs> issues or need. Okay, but I mean, it could be, even if it's only a million I well, we have those discussions where where they can I just be want to make sure he's within. in the loop with all of these yeah. okay oh, I, I think that's yeah i think that's what we got are clear enough yes mm -hmm. clear as mud clear as mud <laughs> clear as storm water <laughs> i'd have to go do them all by the way so <laughs> but it takes money well, we'll, what we'll do is we'll work with getting you some kind of cash flow what that would look mm -hmm. like when the priority the project extent would be done as part of that and bring you something so we can mm -hmm. maybe a right. assessment increase to start doing those projects. And, and we'll look at it as a way to deal with the MSBUs because I think you're right, there's only a handful there of stormwater MSBUs that mm -hmm. we may be able to deal with right. um, as part of this process. That, that would kind of go back to the answer your concern about how are we doing this and if we set it up now, what do we don't want to change you know, later, kind of like paving assessment, we, we want to continue. We can, yeah, we're going to change that. Now's the time to get this. So. All righty. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank okay, you. I appreciate you. it. All right. Adjourn. Yes, we're adjourned. Thank, Thank you. you.